Hey, I'm Sterling, the founder of CEOs. Uh, we help businesses navigate the world of creators, and we help creators navigate the world of business. Uh, I'm going to talk about building a creator-friendly future, what's at stake, and what it takes to actually get there. First, I just want to put an image in your head. It's that the next Bob Dylan is currently driving an Uber. To me, it's a pretty terrible image, the idea of a generational talent sitting around asking for five-star ratings. But the reality is it is a picture of the world that we live in. And it's a reminder that the creator economy is also the gig economy. So yes, in some ways, yet we've never been more empowered. But the flip side of that is that we've never been more overwhelmed. The best quote that sums this up is from a book called The Death of the Artist. And it, the author says, the good news is that you can do it all yourself. The bad news is that you have to. The question is, why are we here? What is this picture of the world that we live in today where these things are possible? It's all really rooted in economic logic, especially economic logic when it meets the internet. As a result, we kind of have this exaggerated system with exaggerated outcomes, which are really built on these three pieces, right? The first is the introduction of zero marginal cost, which then get fed into a world of algorithmic optimization, which then leads to a winner-take-all system for better and for worse. What happens is for big companies, it becomes more economic for them to just wait for some of these winners to emerge than to overpay at the, end, at the other side. So let's look at this logic at play in two systems. Let's look at it in music and in film. So in music, for example, a label will then look at an A&R budget and they'll say, you know what, based on economic logic, this is deemed uneconomic. But on the other hand, you can look about paying Drake $400 million and you can give that the stamp of approval. If you look at this in the world of film and television, for example, you can then say, okay, should we be purchasing indie films, supporting the next generation of film talent? No, it's uneconomic. But can we actually afford to spend $58 million an episode to make a TV series out of Lord of the Rings? Of course we can. And I promise you, these are actually highly educated people making very thoughtful decisions. The logic is entirely consistent with their model of the world. So the problem really isn't the logic, it's the system that that logic operates in. So where does that leave the artist, right? We live in this world where great artists also need to be great marketers, great optimizers, great TikTokers, great token designers. And the question is, what does that mean about who actually succeeds in this new world? If they figure it out, great. But if they don't, it means that we're going to miss the work that they do one way or another. It means that the work may not get made, but perhaps even more tragically, it just won't get seen. And this really kind of feeds into this dynamic where you talk to a lot of creators today and they'll tell you that the apparatus of support structures that are meant to help drive their career forward, the agents, the managers, the producers, the platforms, they'll say, call me when you made it. And whether they use that phrase or it's at least that sentiment, it's something that you can only imagine feels like, well, how is this system supposed to work in the first place? The reality is it's just not in the economic interest of large corporations to support emerging creators. It's that simple, really. And it doesn't seem like it's a lot to ask to build a better system that is more creator friendly. For example, don't sign any, uh, any lifetime agreements because who's to say that you can make a decision today that you're willing to stand behind for the rest of your life? Maybe no short-term exploding offers where big institutions can leverage their, let's just say, deep knowledge, their power, and their capital to exploit you by putting you into a corner and giving you 72 hours to respond before it disappears. How about no excessive chargebacks or interest rates where they basically act as loan sharks and predatory lenders um, or operating in Hollywood accounting where you don't get to see the money that you believe that you're earned, maybe ever. How about data sovereignty and data visibility where those that actually create the data should own their data and at minimum have visibility into how and where it's used? How about public standard agreement structures? Because if you believe that you're operating a fair deal, why can't you put it out into the world? Why do you have to wait for Kanye to tweet out your deal terms, you know, 10 years later? How about credit, consent, and compensation for downstream use 
so that you actually see how the work that you create and put out into the world is used. How about a commitment to mitigating algorithmic burnout, right? We live in a world where businesses that are nominally great for creators will have business models that are predicated on creating ever more ad inventory, which only leads to one road, which is the road to burnout for a creator. So the only way to actually create change in the system is to use the same economic logic that they understand today. To do that, we have to navigate a couple premises about these companies that we're actually talking about. Companies are always going to act to maximize self-preservation. It's kind of rule one. And that means that they're going to act in their own interest, especially when their interest conflicts with yours. That interest is going to be governed by their economic logic. And that economic logic is embedded into their business model. Premise number two, good people work at bad companies. But let's not even call them bad. Let's just say good companies with bad business models. Let's be even more sensitive and say, companies whose business models are at odds with the needs and interests of creators, if we want to be as diplomatic as we can. So how do you get a good company to change, or any company to change? You have to change their economic interests. And this reminds me of a phrase that I, I've heard personally from politicians, and I know many others have, which is uh, when you talk to them, they'll say, it's this, it's, uh, I'd love to vote for it, but until my constituents demand it, I can't. That logic is the same logic that operates inside the systems that govern the creative industries. They live in a world controlled by their business model. And Stuart Brand, who created this concept called pace layering, which is on the left, it's a really effective lens to look at this. It describes the rate of change in systems. The surface layer changes really frequently, and the core rarely changes, if ever. But the core is the structure upon which everything else is determined. And that same logic applies to business. So how do we actually move from a world that's less creator friendly to a world that's more creator friendly? It's by making more, cre uh, more creator friendly decisions the economic choice. When it comes to Web3, Web2 was a dam that basically held back the river of creativity and then controlled the rate at which that flowed through a system where those companies and those systems were able to determine how it went through, where it went as a consequence, and they made money along the way. Web3 is really the engine that is showing really big cracks in that old system. That shift is underway, and if you want to talk about it, this is really the reason that Facebook changed its name to Meta. It wasn't some PR rebranding exercise so much as it was that plus a realization that data sovereignty, data portability, moved from an economic liability to an economic imperative because that's where the world was going. It's why DAOs and NFTs have taken off, because Web3 has unleashed bottom-up demand for community ownership and co-creation. It's why creator houses are building billion dollar brands, because it's much easier to take loyalty and turn that into scale than it is to take scale and try and turn that into loyalty. Once you see this in the context of the larger shift that's going uh, on in society, you can't really unsee it. We've moved from this world where it was the age of the corporation, where if you wanted to opt out of that system, you were completely cast out. Social media brought us into the age of the individual, where folks discovered their own individual power and started to use it. But the age of the collective, the age that we're in now, and the age that Web3 is helping break through and accelerate, is an age where creators collaborate to put that collective power into work. That future is emerging right now. It's when supporters fund and then participate in TV pilots. It's when NFT sales from a single can fund an entire record where an artist can then own their masters and walk in with that leverage, that money, and that community to go make a deal if they so choose. And it's when platform take rates start falling from 45% to 15% to 5%. When companies compete to be the most friendly to creators, creators win. And that's a good world. So the question is, how can we make sure that the future is, in fact, creator-friendly? I'll leave you with three steps. Support projects with creator-friendly DNA. Two, help creators connect to those projects. And three, let the institutions know that the economic logic that they've been looking for has finally arrived. Thank you.